Okay, so now I'm delighted to introduce the uh, moderator of the next panel, uh, my, co my beloved colleague, Usha Iyer. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for being here this morning. I'm Usha Ayer, Assistant Professor of Film and Media Studies in the Department of Art and Art History, and it's my great honor uh, to invite you to this panel on history and memory. I will, um, so um, I'm not gonna do detailed introductions of the speakers in the interest of time, but we have with us Julie Old, artist and curator. Julie, if you could join us on stage. <laughs> Oh, that's okay. Patty Chang, artist and professor of art at the University of Southern California. Yan Wo, artist, and Shen Sin, artist. I wanted to remind you that the bios can be found using the QR code on the program or online at the conference program. I also wanted to mention that there will be a lunch break after this, at the conclusion of this panel. Um, so use the QR code on your paper program to see a map of the lunch options. Uh, and I now invite Julie Old to the podium. Um, I'm thrilled to be here, and I want to thank Marcy and everyone uh, for including me in this event. During the COVID-19 pandemic, when museums, libraries, and archives were closed or restricted, I had the challenge of hunting and gathering images for the book I was putting together of Karen Heger's work. Higa was a curator at the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles from 1992 to 2006, and a scholar specializing in Asian American and Japanese American art. She died in 2013 at the age of 47. The artist, Tokio Uyama, often figured into Higa's research. An Issei who immigrated at age 19 to study art in San Francisco, Higa has outlined his participation in art communities, thank you, <gasps> thanks Marcy, um, in art communities in the 1920s and 30s, including co-founding the Shaku Dosha Association dedicated to studying and advancing modern art in LA's Little Tokyo. Higa noted, quote, by working in the Western medium of oil on canvas, the painters associated with the Shaku Dosha decoupled artistic style from race, end quote. Uyama exhibited domestically and in Europe and Mexico until his career was cut short during World War II. In 1942, Executive Order 9066 called for the forced removal and confinement of people of Japanese ancestry living in the Western states. Uyama and his wife Suye were incarcerated at the Santa Anita racetrack and then sent to Camp Amache in Colorado where he led the art department. In the catalog accompanying her 1992 exhibition, The View from Within, Japanese American Art from the Internment Camps, Higa wrote, quote, Uyama was technically accomplished and worked in an academic style that focused on realistic depictions of the Amachi landscape. The complete absence of conscious commentary on the incarceration in his painting is noteworthy. He focused on what was formally dynamic, end quote. A notable exception was the evacuee, which showed Suye crocheting in their back barrack and Heger interpreted as, quote, a quiet moment of normalcy and contemplation that in many ways sums up the experience of camp, end quote. After three years of imprisonment, the Uyamas returned to LA, unsure if they still had a home. As Japanese Americans left the camps, they primarily encountered hostility, threats of violence, and loss of their homes and businesses. They, however, were fortunate. Despite government pressure and economic hardship, Mrs. Wilson, their principled landlady, had refused to rent the house in their absence. She kept it as they left it and stocked the fridge for their homecoming. Returning to the, pic sorry, returning to the picture research, photographs of Uyama's art classes are accessible on websites. However, I could not locate images of his paintings in the online archives of California art history and Japanese American culture. Fortunately, in the one thing leads to another throes of research, I came across an article in the New York Times titled, 
After internment, a store was, oh, this is so hard to say, a store was born. It's still an LA staple. The store, Bunkado, Bunkado, House of Culture, the gift shop committed to Japanese arts and crafts on East First Street in the heart of Little Tokyo. Higa noted, quote, the post-war pressures of starting anew made the pursuit of art making impossible for some, including Uyama, end quote. According to his niece, Irene Tsukata Simonian, when a shipment of his paintings in transit to Japan burned in the docks at LA in a fire, quote, he didn't want to be an artist anymore. That's when he wanted to open a gift shop to still have a connection, end quote. The Uyamas founded Bunkado in 1946 to foster a market for Japanese culture, selling art and calligraphy supplies, music, books and stationery, ceramics, toys, housewares, decor, and more. Its location is the site of Little Tokyo's first Japanese-owned business, the Kamei Restaurant, which was opened in 1884. Tokyo died in 1954 when Suye died in 69, Tokyo's brother and sister-in-law took over the shop. Years later, their daughter Irene began helping out and eventually started running the store herself, which she still does. Running the store includes caretaking Uyama's artwork and papers that are stored on the second floor. Irene, Irene Tsukata, had long revered Karen Higa's work and kindly welcomed me to visit for the research. I was excited to see over a dozen of her uncle's paintings. She brought out boxes of his sketches, journals, and photos, presumably the tip of the iceberg. I wanted to have some of his work professionally documented for reproduction in Karen's book. Joshua White photographed many paintings, drawings, and notebooks, and the hope is that the new pictures will aid in circulating Uyama's work anew. Josh took this image on the ground floor at the back of the shop. The informal arrangement of art, artifact, and stuff reveals personal narrative, collective history, and everyday function. In the lower left corner, we see a reproduction of the evacuee with a box made by Irene's mother, Kayoko, behind it. The rolls of ribbon are for gift wrapping. The folders in front contain vintage Japanese records. A small photograph of Mr. and Mrs. Uyama, taken at the store during Nisei week in 1949, sits to the right. The calligraphy in front reads Reiwa, the current era of Japan. Uyama's self-portrait, painted in July of 1943 while confined, presides. His impenetrable gaze renders the work a complex commentary on incarceration. This diagram of context exemplifies the importance of in situ-ness. The arrangement unites art and artifact, remembrance and history, past and present, things that collecting institutions typically codify and separate. Part shop, part gallery, part study and community center, Buncado is a space for looking, learning, and excavating histories, not to mention shopping. This situation raises questions. Is it invariably a positive for artists' works and papers to be formalized and preserved in museum collections and archives? While, they are while these institutions, collecting institutions, are primary sources for the potentially infinite production of history, they are paradoxical. They enliven, deaden, expose, and suppress. Obviously, I mean this theoretically, and not to critique any um, institution in particular, least of all, AAAI, which we are here to celebrate. What is, what is gained and lost in subject, what is, what is gained and lost in subjecting art and cultural practices to institutional conservation from inducting them into formalized history? These are ongoing inquiries that cannot be answered readily and are addressed in practice. But one practicality came to the fore as I was researching. Collecting institutions require tremendous financial, staffing, and spatial resources to acquire, preserve, catalog, document, manage, and disseminate their holdings. These processes produce bureaucratic and economic obstacles within an organization itself and for those of us who want to research, access, and reproduce images or exhibit objects. Irene runs Bunkado in the spirit of her uncle's vision for the store as an artist mecca. 
Her nephew, Dane, has been helping at the shop and quickly became the store historian. This third, third generation establishment may well encompass another and beyond. I cannot imagine a more appropriately historically layered environment for Uyama's work than the dynamic community hub that he helped generate in Little Tokyo. Although two blocks of the original area were designated a National Historic Landma Landmark District in 1995, LA's Little Tokyo has been increasingly subject to ramped up cultural gentrification, new construction, and luxury housing, gradually erasing and replacing the neighborhood. Authorized history is again and again challenged by the reemergence of what has been omitted. Karen Heger's writing beautifully fills in some of the fissures created by exclusionary modes in the historical narratives of art. While Uyama has largely been excluded from California's 20th century art history, his work is not invisible. Irene's PS to a recent posting on their website reads, each of these paintings is showcased on our second floor. Stop by the store and see them in person. Thank you, and uh, thank you, and now Patty is going to, Patty Chang is our next panelist. Um, thank you, thank you for um, Marcy and everyone on the team for inviting me here. Um, it's an honor to be here, and thanks, Julie, for your first um, talk. And I just also wanted to say on the subject of Karen Higa that we're having a, in relation to her book uh, release, we're having a panel at the Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles exactly one week from today. So if anyone's interested, please look that up. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. Thank you. I identify as a mammal. <laughs> this line begins the second paragraph of the introduction to Alexis Pauline Gum's book, Undrowned, Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Mammals. The next sentence is, I identify as a black woman ascending with and shaped by a whole group of people who were transubstantiated into property and kidnapped across an ocean. The third sentence is, and like many of us, I am simply attracted to the wonders of marine life. The complexity of hearing those lines together brings up many emotions. They tell me so many things about self-identification, about scales of belonging, about the depth of trauma, and about plain old joy and wonder at being alive. How these things are all true separately, but even more so together. Further in the book, she talks about the use of the word identification in science to recognize and name species. She asks us to think about two different, uh, two different definitions of identification to shift how we understand the purpose of this word. How identification, quote, also known as that process through which we say what are its properties, to identification, quote, that process through which we expand our empathy and the boundaries of who we are become more fluid because we identify with the experience of something different, maybe someone of a whole different so-called species, unquote. This is an image of a gloved hand on a deceased harbor porpoise. The harbor porpoise is a marine mammal that lives near the shore in salt water seas. It breathes air like humans and comes up to the surface in order to survive. Harbor porpoises are described as being very shy and avoid coming up near boats. Quote, when surfacing for air, they do not splash. Since 2021, I have been in a collaborative project named Learning Endings with Astrida Neymanis, a scholar in feminist environmental studies based in Canada, and Alexia Neymanis, a wildlife pathologist who works with marine mammals based in Sweden. We started working together in January 2021 at the height of pandemic, 
And the question we asked ourselves was, what can we learn about endings in this period full of endings during climate crisis through necropsy? In scientific research, necropsy is the examination of an animal after it has died by cutting it open and observing, sometimes also smelling and listening, in order to find out why it has died. Samples are taken and added to databases of information stored for the future. Since we live in three countries over multiple time zones, we met weekly on Zoom to try to think and feel through this question. These meetings were often very early in the morning and very late into the night because of our physical distance. One of the many threads of working in interdisciplinarity was thinking about, about how our separate languages in science, humanities, and art are different. So when we listen and when we speak, we need to engage in hyper-aware ways. We also attended Alexia's necropsies through online video chat. Since she's in Sweden, we would log in in the middle of the night for three to four hours while she talked us through what she was doing and looking at and looking for, and we would ask questions. Our presence online or our roles as outside viewers somehow heightened the importance of the act. When we were beginning the collaboration, I asked Alexia, the scientist, if she would be willing to add a ritual before she began each necropsy. I asked her to take a moment, alone with the animal, think about the animal, touch the animal with her hand, and then take a photo or video to hold the moment for others. This ritual took place alongside the other parts of our collaboration, which included doing interviews with scientists about their emotional selves in relation to this work they do in science, especially the end of life care. This work is one of the last to touch and witness the deaths of animals, and sometimes entire species, can be difficult emotional work. How can we recognize the grief in their work, especially when this aspect of scientists is often overlooked by the public, and also sometimes by those scientists themselves? We are currently asking other scientists who perform necropsies on marine mammals to also engage in this ritual, with the idea of building a touch ritual archive. What is a touch archive if touching is what destroys an archive? Where does the archive live? Is it in the photos gathered of scientists touching the animals? Is it in the animals supporting the scientists? Perhaps the archive is in each individual act of touching, each moment when skin and glove make contact. The archive could also be transferred at this very moment into the body of the scientists receiving the touch, bodies, in fact, being the best storage containers for preservation. Bodies full of feelings cultured by an objective education. This is just the beginning of an archive, the images of one scientist so far. According to Latipa's idea of archival futurism, the archive is a space of memory, a space of intimacy, between the dead, the living, and the yet to be born. An archive is intimate to know another moment and feel it in your body. The images of the touch archive feel resonant because at this moment of touch, it enters into me. In this archive, her body becomes mine. They will become ours. Perhaps non-scientifically, Necropsy is also the search for memory in the body. It is not only evidence, but details that point to lived experience and when laid out, feel like recognition, questions, a hovering, presence, flat out trauma. Toni Morrison writes in The Sight of Memory about trusting her own recollections, but also relying on the re recollections of others. Thus memory weighs Quote, thus memory weighs heavily in what I write, in how I begin, and in what I find to be significant. Zora Neale Hurston said, like the dead seeming cold rocks, I have memories within that came out of the material that went in to make me. These memories within are the subsoil of my work. 
end quote. What is memory but the details of a past that remain, unwilling to retreat, dissolve back, recess and recuse? Isn't the physical material of the body just as good a receptacle for experience as the mind? And aren't memories entrenched in matter? Most of us, if examined closely enough, can tell us things no one has seen. From the necropsy report, quote, received a young sexually immature male harbor porpoise that was mildly autolyzed for examination. This animal was found by caught in a cod net. Cleared net marks were seen on the head, dorsal fin, left flipper, and fluke. Three small gashes were seen on the head. Small pock-like wound was seen on the chin that extended into the blubber. The left axially lymph node was focally discolored. A moderate amount of froth, but no pneumonia was seen in the lungs. A small amount of milk and a few fish eye lenses and otoliths were seen in the forestomach, and milk-like fluid admixed with bile was seen in the pyloric stomach. Comments. This animal was otherwise in good health. Although milk was found in the forestomach, body length and finding date are consistent with a porpoise older than one year of age. With the images collected for the Touch Ritual Archive, we're making a memory game or a matching game like the kind played in childhood. These images are printed on four by six photo paper and turned backside up, the images hidden underneath the emulsion or ink below the surface. An image is flipped, a hand resting on a fin or gently touching the tail. Somewhere underneath the paper, white as foam, is its match, its double waiting to recognize it, to see it for what it is, exactly what it is and no thing or no one else. The moment when the two images meet, the other says, I found you. In all these images, all these moments, you were there to meet me over time and space. As the touch ritual archive grows and the memory game expands, the possibility of recognition of being found becomes less and less, the harder it becomes to play and hold in your head. The touch archive and the memory game are the combination of an action to connect the living and the dead through time with the random chance of coincidence in emergence and servicing to bring forth a moment of recognition. This lead up to recognition is the process of building story or multiple stories. These images and thoughts are part of my most recent project. I'm compelled by the necessity of interspecies identification and simply by a love of marine mammals. This current project extends my work around death and ritual, both individual and global, embodied memory and the uses of alternative archives. In the context of this convening, I offer a few connected questions. What is the role of identification with regards to Asian America and our cultural production? How might this idea of lead up to recognition be part of AAPI future story building or archive making? What does it mean to build a collection in the face of loss and death? How might we think about ritual, water, the interdisciplinary and interconnectedness in shaping a story at once collective and individual? What are ways beyond identification and definition to coalesce our group or movement? Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about a work that uh, mutated my brain a little bit. Um, um, and I'm going to destroy it for you. So if you don't want it to be destroyed, then I think you should put something in your ear for the next seven minutes. Um, it's a piece from Felix Gonzalez Doris, and uh, it's titled sometimes untitled Get to Stein. Oh. LSP Talkless and Get to Stein's Grave. Other times it's titled, untitled, LSP Talkless and Get to Stein. Um, we in the cultural left are more eager to play the role assigned to us. We're invited to participate in a debate that has never really been a debate, but a travesty, a red herring to keep us occupied. We should redirect the circus 
toward our agenda and expose what they really want to avoid mentioning. I learned from it to run, to run, to run away from everything I've learned. So in 2009, I think, I was fortunate I hadn't traveled much in my life to um, get a grant and go to Paris for half a year. And I had never been in Paris before, so I went to see the beautiful city of Paris. And of course, during that time I spent, I wanted to see Pierre Lachaise, where uh, Felix Gonzalez Doris had made several uh, artworks, including a puzzle piece with Oscar Wilde's grave. And um, going there, it's uh, still one of my favorite places in Paris, beside of the works of Felix Gonzalez Doris. Um, you would go, it's a touristic thing, so you encounter a lot of other people. And there's a special route because there's a lot of famous people competing with each other for attention. After uh, visiting Oscar Wilde's grave, I went to the grave of Gertrude Stein, and I expected to see this image of beautiful flowers, but there were none. It's a one-person grave that uh, is covered with stones, and unspectacular, mildly said. So I was ready to go to the next destination, but um, by chance, or whatever you call it, I went around this grave. That was like the epitaph of Alice B. Toklas. 20 years after her lover's death, she somehow dug herself into that one person grave. And as in life, as in death, she was in the back. And of course, Felix Gonzalez Doris was binded to this experience and affiliated to this gesture. He didn't serve us what he saw, but he served us the flowers. And um, um, in the title, he reversed their names. I was mad because Julie Old was the one that until 2009 already had provided me information that wasn't really out at the time before her monograph of Phyllis Gonzalez came out. So I called her and I was mad because she didn't tell me and I could easily have missed it. And I don't remember how and what she replied, but uh, I didn't take it for granted. Um, I think time, time later on, she, um, I visited her in her apartment in New York City, and she had been on this tour. Uh, they were together in Paris at the moment that this work uh, had been made. So at the time in analog photography, you would get like this uh, print, like 24 or 36, I can't remember, and she would have like an extra copy that Felix Gonzalez had taken on the trip. So I was fortunate to see, you know, like the tour that had, they had done, like they have been visiting uh, the uh, Eiffel Towers and Arc de Triomphe and whatever you have to see in Paris. And you would see their tour, their touring in, um, uh, in Pierre Lachaise. And you could see they're visiting Jim Morrison's grave they could see the missing, and you know, like the, the grave of Oscar Wilde. And you could see that he, when they went to the grave of Gertrude Stein, and when he discovered the epitaph of Alice B. Toklas, he took several shots. Julie told me that I was not allowed to tell this story, but I did, and I've always done. I never did that in public though, but after taking pictures of the epitaph, he would point down the camera and tell, telling her, this is gonna pay your trip or our trip. Um, 
What did I want to say? I think that learned me that art is a tool and art, an artwork can be decoy. And if people want flower, I think they should have it once in a while. And that you shouldn't put your co yourself in corners that you can't escape from. Thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you for being here. Yes, I'll press. Um, one morning I woke to sleep again, tipping over the bridge, connecting worlds. My body shook to the effect of an explosion of a frozen lake in a dreamscape. The vibrations continue to feel vivid in the next days, the acoustic presence affirming there had indeed been an explosion, something's destruction, something broke open, something was invaded with force or performed a gesture of making space. As someone who makes images moving and still, the past few years personally have been deeply reflective. Like in dreams, time, the agent of change has showed up to challenge where images come from. A lake breaks open accompanied with loud sounds can be perceived as a quiet gesture for it is distant from waking moments. Some knows how to place attention here. The Anishinaabeg people believe that these worlds are one. The knowledge can be passed on from the spiritual world to us through dreams. Some learned how to place attention there. Like my partner, Ali, who's on a journey to become a union analyst, to whom I entrust my dreams with. She says, it might as well be the yin in me making space for the yang. Our discussion mirrored the changes I've made in my practice. I had often needed to paint around the threatening and dangerously politicized circles of nation states due to the latitudes at which relations have been silenced across generations. Searching relationally for subjects images and methodologies, drawing connections without pointing at the interlocutor, manifesting secondary positions while molding shapes and forms. Yet, that is still the young at work. That's where I learned how to listen to the statelessness in contemporary forms, listening to emotions attached to belongings for the Zainichi and the Koryasaram, listening to the Buddhist monks in Europe and on Turtle Island, listened to the self-exiled and the unspoken for. In recent years, I have come to manifest a shift. I believe the integrity of a shapeshifter lies in the aligned openness of the moment. In the meantime, there perhaps has also been a collective repositioning into the yin as we receive while witnessing the consequences of destructions and changes to our homes. The image here is of a recent work entitled Sashi Ngambo Jir, The Earth Turned Green, which was installed at the Swiss Institute in New York this year from May to August. I have described to people that the exhibition felt like I was putting my organs on display. Since the frozen lake dream, I realized this surface of projected images visible on both sides is also the frozen lake, breaking open into Tibetan and English textual forms on the concrete floor, with Mandarin delivered with echo and bass in a clean and well-constructed basement on Lenape Hawking land. For those who desired to tune into listening with intentionality, the differences, the differences in access to languages divided the room into two. The colors and lights through projection shift according to four seasons, depicting a day's passing in each of them, carrying the property and the weight of fog, sun, tree branches, moon, lake, mountains, lightning, and so on. The lake did not just break into text to divide. Its impact could also be said to describe some of our collective urgencies. After my father's passing in 2018, I've inquired into one of the ways to understand lineages. Through DNA, I wanted to look into the past that can't be easily uttered on the land I perceive as home that is also named Sichuan, China. My father, Shen Daohong, 
was a Chinese ink painter who painted Tibetan and Indian figures and portraits in hyperrealism against landscapes captured through our yearly journeys. My disinterest towards his practice at a young age transformed into criticism, having submerged in art education in London. It had always been my argument to point out the violence of how one could objectify communities while not belonging to them. The ancestry result was, however, profoundly sorrowful. As it revealed that both him and I shared Tibetan and Indian ancestry, and simultaneously revealed my missed opportunity to listen to and speak lovingly to my father about his journey and his subconscious ways in seeking for kinship. The realization carried him into so many of my dreams, finding reconciliation in places where misalignment were also present. I committed myself to learning Tibetan two years after his passing. It had made me realize that I need to know differently where to place my attention amidst various misalignments, including the limitation of decolonial critique. For I'm also not just Tibetan. I'm Yi, Gaoshan, Miao, She, Lahu, and many more that can be made known as well as embraced as unknown. History can be so uninventive. Therefore, I seek out and read traces of other forms of knowing, including a book written by Hong Kong professor Wu Rei, who also holds professorship in mainland China, entitled, There is no such thing as Han. Han, a name for a body of water, Han Shui in Han Zhong. As I moved to this land three years ago, I also encountered the 11,000 bodies of water in mini Sota Makoche. There is no need to shrink oneself, that was the lessons everywhere there, taught by the lakes and their names. Bade Makaska, Bade Uman, other lake, Bakegame, Side Lake or Lake Harriet, Badota, Usangwe, Many Lake City, Gaka Bikan, at the waterfalls, or Minneapolis, Owamni, Owamni, Yomni, Falling Water, Gichi Gaka Bika, Great Waterfalls, or St. Anthony Falls. The process of making this work begins with me writing a series of directions for lightning technician Kyle based on how I imagine a day's passing in each, in each season. Kyle, the technician, and I worked to, together to paint the days and documented them in moving images. My Tibetan teacher, Ji Ta Zhong, and I watched the videos after to write sentences that described what happened in the images. Ji then translated the sentences into Tibetan and we spent months learning them in our weekly lessons. I chose to use theater lights to depict seasons, for it has the capacity to reveal the intimacies of how time is marked in three languages present. The tension is pulled through Tibetan, but if one were to look close enough in the other two present, the paths are also there as well. I've learned and imagined the ways Tibetan understand forms. Fruits are blocky shapes on tree. Gold is goats roaming in the mountains. Rain, snow, hail are all just the sky coming down for a visit. But knowing was never the goal, like representation is not provoked here when it comes to agency. I would describe the action of learning as being in relation to the multitude. As one affirms the multitude within, therefore, it is place, placing attention without centering. Bayo Okomolafe spoke about how forces of justice are currently in agreement to bring to the center the ones condemned to the edges, that to be centralized is to be captured, it is to be fully seen, to be made fully available, to be rendered subject, to, make, to be made useful. And as exhilarating as the prospects of being useful is, there is nothing more damning. But how can centering be resisted? Perhaps one needs to learn how to listen again. One of the many ways I feel is to practice one's relation with where, with where one places significance. For this work, it's been about bearing the known and unknown of my family histories and placing attention within languages through modes of learning. In the past few years, I've learned how to be conscious of learning. I've learned blue and green in Tibetan points, points to the impermanence, the sky and the earth. I've learned that the night is not only feminine and motherly, that darkness, which composes part of the word night in Tibetan, is also a forest. 
Darkness as a word is also part of the name of a head of a river that flows through and nurture a community who live in the county bearing the consonant of the word darkness down the stream by an abundant forest. The learning points to values. The values speak to why the attention can be placed into languages and where the alignment for me is situated at the moment. It is about finding our way, our roots, back into the soil. I wonder if language itself is also a form of attention, therefore it is threatening. Hence our witness to the Chinese government shrinking the presence of Tibetan, Mongolian, Uyghur, Yi, and other languages in classrooms. Ji, my Tibetan teacher, a PhD student of the ecology of Tibetan Plateau, has a niece who is around eight years old. Can understand more dialect than me, but can't write or read language or comprehend as much grammar compared to myself, a student with just one year of learning. When she used to appear on screen, I had always felt a bit shy. Knowing through my experiences learning other languages that children are quick in learning for they also live the language. But ever since my teacher explained to me how her classroom is conducted in Mandarin and her actual level of Tibetan, my feelings changed. Knowing one is a multitude is an abundant and sustainable gift one could think of in relation to the next generation. But in places that have been dictated by uninventive histories, where one is not encouraged to have relationships with multiple dimensions of memories, one also could learn to embrace the unknown and live in the absence of knowledge. For those places are everywhere and nowhere at once. The unknown is a result of many, forgetfulness being one, and a place where transgenerational trauma can be held. If the grandparents have learned and taught others how to forget, be sure of it, then the mountains and fault lines will show us some of the traces of how we have forged our relations with them, partly through forgetfulness. I have spent some of my days writing about the fault lines that traverse the plateaus, the steppes, and the basin through their histories and their futures alongside with writing lovingly, as lovingly as I know how to, about my kings. There have always been multiple ways to make and create from multiple places. I understand my attention as just one form and that the frozen lake couldn't be blasted open just by warming temperature or heated urgencies. Rather, the explosion describes an absence to be learned and adapted to, to eventually feel safe to inhabit through life and death across generations as one inhabits one's dreams as worlds. Thank you. I come to this response with all the humility of something of an outsider. I'm not an art historian, definitely not an artist. I work in film and media studies, and I'm still figuring out if I'm Asian American or not. Um, I am an Asian who moved in middle age to America, happens to be working in America. So I'm counting on you, the audience, to bring more erudite questions around both around Asian American art to our discussion. By way of my response, I found um, the four presentations so generative to think through questions that I have been asking as well alongside the first panel today on intimacies. Um, and so I wanted to begin with Julie Old's presentation, uh, which, is, which intertwines communal history of Japanese internment, Second World War, with the familial memory through the gift shop, Bunkado, uh, which is handed down from one generation of the Ueyama family to the next. Um, and the very meanings of Asian and Asian American altering from the 1940s to the present as she kind of relates to us one generation after another taking over this gift shop. Um, so that in addition to personal, familial, community, national histories, there is the global geopolitics in that arrangement of images, if we could go back. Um, there is, we also get a sense through the layering of the objects here, the global geopolitics of relations between the US and Japan that also weighs on these images and their arrangement in the store, which serves a memorializing function within the changing landscape of Little Tokyo. And so we have these multiple nested worlds of Japanese Americans in Little Tokyo, in Los Angeles, and these global histories and memories all residing together on that one table. 
Um, but it also then led me to think the Japanese internment camp made, makes me think of Guantanamo, which went from being a carceral space for black Haitian refugees to bearded Asian Muslim men post 9-11. So these spaces that hold various Asian bodies and Asian American bodies. And um, it also made me think about the ease with which the American was erased from the Ueyama's identity during the war, having contemporary resonances. For instance, in the murder of Shireen Abu Akhle, the Asian American, Palestinian American journalist, uh, where the US government refuses to query the Israeli forces so that in her death, she's rendered only an Asian, a Palestinian, and not an American, right? So when do these terms get disaggregated, these hyphenated identities get separated? Um, or let's think for a moment of the Iranian-American women supporting their sisters in Iran who are, who are cutting their hair and burning their chadors on the streets, even as many here, many Iranian American women here might choose the whale to mark their rebellion against white supremacist Islamophobia. So this panel shows us how these complex interactions between these many Asias and these many Americas produce a staggering range of transregional, transcontinental histories. And each of us carries particular memories of our own locations and migrations and they're multiple, and we carry them in our bodies, our accents, our clothes, our ways of walking, talking, and as Shin reminds us, of dreaming as well. Um, so in calling for finding our way, our roots back into the soil, Shenzhen made me think of how Buddhism is an older inter-Asian connective thread across East, South, and Southeast Asia. As we think about these many diasporas and these many Asias that they're coming from, and these very categories of East Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, we have to remember are wrought by US academic area studies that split the world into areas for their own Cold War purposes of studying us. Um, so what imaginations of Asia and Asian America do we generate when we turn to religious, spiritual, ritual practices like Patty Chang also gestures to? It makes me think of how Sufi spiritual practices produce shared embodied mystical practices across Western, Central, and South Asia, more of these areas, right? And their diasporas in the US, all in the midst of this ever-threatening Islamophobia that I mentioned earlier. Shenzhen's work with languages also points to, on the one hand, the profoundly Eurocentric colonial construction of what knowledge is so that even inter-Asian dialogues as we're having today happen through the intermediary of hegemonic Western languages and thought systems, which they are countering in their work and their commentary on their work. But their work also expands this. They say there is no need to shrink oneself, moving us across Tibetan, Mandarin, English, Dakota, and Anishinaabe words. So across the presentations on this panel, I thought of how such stereophonic methods, if we might think of these as multiple ways of listening, invite us to listen to multiple histories of Asias and Asian Americas. And Patty Chang extends that to a planetary dimension with a caring attention to species histories and memories. When we think Asia and Asian America from other, location, or other locations than the Euro-American vantage point, when we think from the ocean, when we might discover interconnectivities and radical relationalities, we may center kinship and ethical reciprocity through embodied histories and ritual. Indeed, when she asks, aren't memories entrenched in matter, she emphasizes embodied memory. And we may think of the multiple bodies in this panel as history, the body as the archive. Um, and it made me think, and this might be a question, I realize I haven't been asking enough questions to all of you, um, but is archival research a bit like the necropsy that Patty is describing? Because many of you are interested in the question of the archive. Um, and of the work that Julie does with Ueyama also as a touch ritual, right? Going to the store, taking these pictures, producing a certain archive of this work. Um, 
and we feel the, the kind of environmental question around the touch ritual so that we feel, I felt as I was reading the presentations earlier, a catch in our throat when we read that this was a young porpoise still feeding on its mother's milk and killed before its time by the industrial complex of human fishing, right? So what are these relationalities that we cannot hold that are incommensurate? And um, the, the, uh, Patty's reference to a memory game makes us think about the movement from a ritual of touching the porpoise to creating that image that then circulates to an archive, to a game, so that we may archive all of the human destroyed species that we are trying to remember and match to each other and keep alive in our memory at least. So that this panel is going, from, going across multiple scales of history and memory. And Jan Vo takes us to this impossibility, just as this kind of planetary impossibility of remembering that uh, Patty alerts to, Jan Vo takes us to the impossibility of fixing experience and the dynamic creation of arti artistic histories and lineages that happen between artist, in this case, Gonzalez Torres, and artist curator, Jan Vo himself, and the queer circuits between these two. So that the tombstone with Gertrude Stein and to Alice Toklas, in fact, gestures to one on each side, the seen and the unseen. Um, the wandering around, which has always been central to queer archival and queer artistic reading experiences, to make the unseen visible. It gives me a sense that being in diaspora is not a unidirectional relationship, going there in search of that grave with the flowers, but a dwelling in a third space that makes certain images or certain kinds of work quintessentially diasporic. So maybe that's a question. What do we think of as diasporic art, as Asian American art in this instance? And speaking of history and memory, and these are just my closing remarks, I'm also thinking of the Asian Americans that become in further invisible through multiple migrations. The indentured diaspora of Chinese and Indian workers in the Caribbean who migrated to the US in the 80s and onwards, 70s and 80s onwards. They're Asian, they're American, and they're Caribbean. And they evoke for us longer histories of the Asian in the Americas. Uh, so that we expand America to include the Americas as well. So in traversing, for example, South Asia and South America, for instance, the Indo-Caribbean artists that I think about uh, who are located in North America, they bring up questions of double diasporic histories and memories. There is no simple singular homeland and new home, but their bodies serve as archives of multiple migrations, multiple traumas, and multiple intimacies with black fellow plantation workers, with indigenous populations, say in Guyana and Suriname, and with fellow Asian indentured workers. So these nested histories of colonialism, labor exploitation, of creolization, which is another term we can bring in from the Americas, points us to what Lisa Lowe has so eloquently discussed as the intimacy of four continents, Asia, America, Africa, and Europe. And the symposium's title, I Am You, You Are Too, reminds us of those connections and the need to form solidarity across these differences, and as well as holding the tensions in these intimacies that we've been discussing so that we may conjure spaces of shared dwelling. And so just by way of questions as we move into discussion, I was thinking of the pandemic, which comes up in, in some of your presentations. Julie and Patty, for example, ask questions about uh, the archive within working conditions during the pandemic. And so I wanted us to, we can't forget that Asia and Asian America were, um, were, were hit hard and in very particular ways by the pandemic, whether in physical, material, or psychic ways. Um, and our sense of history and loss has been heightened during this period that we, we feel like we are emerging out of. Uh, but we've also developed maybe a sense of slight detachment from conventional expectations and ambitions in relation to archiving. Has our relationship to the archive altered during the pandemic was one question that your presentations made. Uh, may think about. Uh, so the, and can we bring in questions of speculation and lost archives as a generative uh, context? I'll stop here and I look forward to your questions as we engage with these four amazing presentations. Thank you. Um, I don't have a you know, deep answer or anything about the um, 
relationship to archives changing except to say, in my experience during the pandemic, wanting to access, you know, images for Karen's book, that it wasn't a lonely experience, but I wasn't able to go to an archive. And I love researching and going to the archive and um, not fetishizing material, but being with the material and the body of information material and listening to it and, and finding, th you know, discovering and learning. So of course I couldn't do that, but I suppose why I talk about the shop and Irene is like Irene was one of many people who, it, because the archives were not accessible and I, UCLA, wherever, were not open. Mm -hmm. you know, very bureaucratic uh, response or so. But then I found such goodwill in the communities that Karen worked with mm -hmm. that was alive and made all the material that I was gathering become more alive. So that's what I missed. And I don't think it's just because of the pandemic. It's sometimes the difference between as archives and um, and libraries have become digitized. There's not the in-person visit so much required. And uh, so there's a distancing that takes place. And when I said archives have, or museums and archives have the potential to expose and suppress or to deaden and enliven, mm. of course, you know, any situation, it could have been that way at Bunkato as well. But I found the personal connections to be very moving and the personal connections, like someone like Irene, who is avidly representing her uncle's work for years and years and years. And she has, she knows Janum, she knows other places, <laughs> she's in touch with people. People have asked to donate the work and she hasn't yet because it's in good hands. So I found that very um, refreshing actually, you know, in, as a result of the mm -hmm. research. This, yeah, Patty, did you want to raise? Um, yeah, I think that's really beautiful how to think about like alternative situations of constructing archive um, in you know lived experience and our everyday, um, and just to sort of think about where the work that I presented sort of came out of. And yes, it was actually very directly related to the situation of pandemic because of physical distance. Mm -hmm. You know, in my work, I always. I do think about the embodied a lot and um, and experience and so originally um, you know when I thought oh pandemic is just going to last a couple months you know I'll I'll go and and visit Alexia in Sweden and stay there and attend you know and sort of just observe and attend and because that s became impossible the alternative that I sort of came up with was well. Perhaps you can, you know, do something um, to to kind of so that we can see, you know, we can sort of feel or see whatever it is that you do, um, and and then you know that's kind of how it came about. And because she was doing multiple necropsies, and each time she would do it, it became larger and larger. And then the idea of that, you know, of more than one, and of mm -hmm. you know, one after the other, and then you know, growing. Um, just became part of the language of the the ritual and the experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then Sin, if you have, if you want to respond to any aspect of each other's presentations before we ask some questions from the audience. <laughs> Um, maybe I can say something in relation to your response and um, some of the thoughts I've had listening. Um, I think in, in the writing uh, for the presentation, I wrote history can be so uninventive, speaking mm -hmm. to the negative. But at the same time, in terms of archive and history, I, actually there are ways to look at it that are extremely inventive, like if we're talking about Islam and thinking about Uyghur history mm -hmm. and um, this book, um, Sacred Routes to Uyghur History has been like, you know, a reference for me uh, in my research. Um, thinking about how a Persian prince 
traveling from one place to the other can, on the manuscript, be crossed out and exchanged with the Buddhist monk as a protagonist because that was the way to practice history in Uyghur manuscript in terms of changing the context of the, from, from which the protagonist is speaking from and f therefore the people could receive the message differently. And those little changes are capped um, if you can find it. I've only read that it's capped, but I, can, I have never witnessed it. So I guess there are very inventive ways um, as well in thinking about archive and history. And then if you think about mountains and lakes, um, nowadays, you know, th there are certain fault lines, like Shinshui He fault line is a fault line traveling in Sichuan. And people are thinking about oh, the underground heat as a resource to extract, um, but they call it new energy. But at the same time, it is not new because it is new. It's new because it came later. It's not prioritized. So that is a way of naming or seeing that is not, um, that is completely hierarchical. So, but there is another way of seeing that can, I suppose, challenge that and provoke that um, in relation to the people around it. And if I can give another example, just very quickly, Tianshan Mountain, which is um, located um, in uh, behind Ulumuchi and um, when Communist Party decided to build a factory, um, they decided to build it in between the mountain and the city, hence stopping the invasion, the possible invasion to the factories. But the factory completely polluted the mountain, and the glacier is melting into half, um, and it continues to do so. But that, for me, is a way of seeing that. Um, you know, in terms of archiving our movements and our relations, those factories, the choices of building them there, says a lot about the relationship then with, in terms of people and nature, I suppose. Yeah. Jan, will you finish? Uh, it's functioning, no? Okay, then I'm gonna use this opportunity since it has been on display uh, during this thing here. Um, and that is the collection of Martin Wong and Florence Fee, his mother. And it's presented, which I, you know, like I haven't been able to control the mediation of it. Um, but I could have lived without it unless it was fun to meet Mark Johnson and Florence Fee. Mm. And what I learned and what I meant about learning from Felix Gonzalez Doris that art is also a tool, you know. So art is a tool. Mm -hmm. So I had beforehand ask, used a lot of time asking all my connections to different kind of museum, realizing that many people knew in San Francisco the existence of Florence Fee's, uh, uh, the collection that she had built it with her son. None of them was interested in taking over the responsibility. Beside of that, trying to get paintings out of the estate. Mm -hmm. So I had to take the role. And I don't even consider it as an artwork. I would have loved if Florence, we could make her into a robot and it would stay <laughs> forever. We couldn't. She was 97 or something like this. Mm -hmm. And she talked about the estate sale. Maybe it should have been a garage sale. Maybe it should have wow. been. I, in a moment of nostalgia, sentimentality, I enable it. And that was what happened, you know? So it's not even because I consider it as an artwork of mine. It was a tool to use the artwork for this. Yeah. That is great <laughs> and interesting. We have some both specific and expansive questions from the audience, but given what Jan just said, I wanted to go to one of these big questions, and this is to all of, uh, all of you. Um, the person says, is it normal for art to be collected by institutions? What other outlets do artists with bodies of work have? Uh, what are the, can we broaden, the, can the range of institutions be broadened? What is the need for artists to make 
connections and what is the need for artists to make connections with them? What should institutions do in terms of outreach and how to select artworks? Um, <laughs> These are major questions, be, yes. A lot of questions. I just want to say that there's too few places for artists to make money to survive. <laughs> so that's one, you know, this very practical thing, um, thinking about those questions about where art should live, you know, because I think that, you know, as you said, art is a tool, you know, there is, uh, it can do things, um, but, you know, it's sequestered in certain spaces and, um, and those, you know, spaces are guarded heavily um, and not, you know, most people aren't let in and so there is a limit to, you know, um, how you can survive and move through those and how art can then infiltrate other parts of life. Yeah, and I do like the spirit of the big question because this is a convening where we have artists, curators, art historians. It becomes the space to ask these really big questions and kind of chew on them through the day. So it's not like we have to have specific responses now. Right. But go ahead, Julie. Well, just a thought that, I mean, because mostly recently, well, let's say with the book, Karen's book, I've been you know, let's say working with dead artists or so. And so I think in terms of the archive also, or the museum that's collecting, for instance, the, the AAAI, you know, it's of interest to me, how are the, what are the criteria gonna be? And I know as far as Marcy has, you know, talked about so far, it's quite open. When I asked her on the phone, so what does it mean, Asian American art? She said, well, no, we're not defining it and you know, leave it open. But I wonder also how open is that and how will, um, you know, how, for me it's important not just contemporary collecting, for instance, but how do things actually enter the archive that then can potentially become part of history? Doesn't mean they become part of history, but the potential is there, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So I kind of throw it back as something that I hope we can talk about more in the, uh, maybe also when we talk about the Martin, Martin Wong uh, catalog resume, et cetera. Right. Jan and Sim, did you want to respond to the big questions about <laughs> objects and institutions? Um, I, I think it's quite case specific, as in during the pandemic, I guess a few of us gathered and started to, started as reading group, but then manifested into um, a loose collective that works on an individual basis but come together and then exchange. But that is very case specific because we're speaking to people who have access to Chinese language who care about the region uh, that speak Mandarin and different dialects but are dominated by specific politics and we want to find ways to voice out and speak to um, our pain and sufferings. Um, but then in terms of delivering, I guess it becomes difficult because normally people will say, well, just put it online, it will be pervasive, everyone can see it, but that's not going to be the case. So we're still navigating that space and thinking about how, um, how one could really, truly be case specific about distribution. Um, but then at the same time, I am personally navigating questions from students who say things like, um, you know, why do you even like the museum? Mm -hmm. and, um, and some of my colleagues say, will say to me that, you know, they will get over it, they're young. Um, but <laughs> at the same time, I, yeah, I find materials where people are hopeful and organizing in a different way with the museum. Um, for them, and they are very excited to see those things. Um, so, I, yeah, I, th I think it's very case specific. If we're talking about North America, then we have to go there. But, yeah, and the location of the of the institutions and the museums, right, across these, whether it's the Americas or in Asia, where in these huge spatial kind of configurations are we imagining these institutions, and who can access them? I can say also that, um, I mean, you know, culture is for the privilege, you know. What I'm missing is that we don't make an effort. I mean, it's turning into competitions, you know, museums, whatever, is getting bigger and bigger, and everybody have, like, it creates, and I am the first one to say that artists are 
responsible. No, it creates like this culture where it becomes a monument where each place have to have like a imprint of something that's fancy or, or you know, whatever people want, you know. And I miss like these places that you encounter and that you come and if it is an archive or a concentration of an artist's production, you know. And I say I'm the artist are to blame, you know. But it's also created through a structure that creates the identity of an artist today. And I think that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was just going to, I'm sort of like in the middle of a thought, but I was thinking about what you were saying about, um, you know, about the, the institution and, um, and, and then bringing it back to Julie's, your comment about, um, you know, asking them, asking Marcy about the definition of Asian America and, you know, um, the idea of particularity and specificity, um, I think that relates to Shen, your comment and how um, that, um, you know, how do we kind of, instead of taking the umbrella of the institution or the identity, mm -hmm. look at it more in terms of how we, and I'm gonna make an analogy here that's kind of cheesy, it's thinking about water, it's like sometimes it's large and placid you know, and then sometimes it's underground and in pockets, you know, mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, that, yes, you know, we're all convening in here for a reason, you know, because we somehow relate to this category. Um, but, you know, some of us have maybe more um, mainstream platforms and we will use strategies to occupy those spaces. And some of us, you know, obfuscate. Some of us are interested in being hidden or intimate. So how, you know, and we will occupy those spaces. Um, but that more so than thinking about these broad terms, like how is it, you know, relationally that we can sort of connect and network and support each other in our particularities as, you know, <laughs> and I think as long as we are self-reflexive about the erasures that are constantly happening, even as these affirmative spaces and new institutional systems of support happen, you know, or are we just consoling ourselves saying that we, now where is the rural in all of this, right, in our imaginations? Um, all of those questions, but here's a question from the audience. I want to get to these before we run out of time. Um, this is for Patty uh, from David Palumbo Liu, who says, thank you for a beautiful and powerful presentation that makes one consider interspecies empathy, um, uh, but also then leads to a question about international and the question of empathy or the lack of it. Uh, uh, they say, I think of photos of tortured Ukrainian bodies being immediately affective and the relative absence of protests um, on Iranian and Palestinian tortured bodies. How do we account for complicity responsibility in relation to your question of identification, your point about identification? <laughs> Okay, I know this is very serious. Can you can you repeat that again? I'm so um, to the, when the, the photos of tortured Ukrainian bodies were immediately affective, and uh, while the relative absence of protests around Iranian and Palestinian tortured bodies makes us think about identification, I'm I'm vocalizing here for David. Um, to make us think about complicity, responsibility, and what are we made to identify with, which I think in my response also is this question of um, identification and the complex questions that relates to everything we've been saying just now of who are we continuing to center and raise. Right, yeah. I mean, I think it also has to do with boundaries to, um, you know, between the, you know, looking at different people differently or different um, species differently. Um, I mean, I'm not sure if I have a good answer for that, but but that in some ways that, you know, like, 
part of the the thinking that I had into you know wanting to try to find ways to make connection between something that is so different, you know, in order to want to do something about it. You know, like I, for me, and everyone is different in how they make art or why they make art, but for me, like, um, the, you know, this kind of art making is what I do, and so I, you know, how do we, how can we, you know, use whatever tools we have to find connection with things that are, things or um, the someone that's different than us, right? Um, and um, I don't know how to solve that problem for, you know, international. I mean, mm. I want to think about that, of course, um, but that, you know, using different ways to create connection to then, um, step into something else. And, you know, I think that that's a function of artwork um, and maybe why, you know, we find it as humans compelling um, to be in somebody else's space or in another, you know, dimension or psychic space. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think more than, you know, having an answer for that is just like expressing the desire for that or the need for that and then each individual finding ways to you know, um, to bridge or move. I mean, some of it is about moving oneself, right, into another space. And, and I think that's so central, you know, for me to think about. Yeah. I'm sorry if I didn't answer the question fully. Yeah, but it was really fun watching you think. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have time for it? Okay. Um, so I'll um, get to this question of the eco-critical. Um, this question says there is an... There is an evocation of the long durée in the eco-critical thread that is present in all the presentations. How do you think through the scale of memory entrenched in matter? What are the ethics of this potentially infinite expansion of time? And does entropy or lifetime of matter limit the possibilities of connection and time traces? A big question, I know. <laughs> I feel like the question of the eco-critical and of queerness have come up as eruptions, but if anyone wants to pick up on those as we close out the panel and think about history and memory. Yeah, yeah. I, say something. I think that uh, the problem is that we think in human time. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, very few artists have learned me to think beyond your own time. And uh, I've, you know, like I've been researching in Tsunoguchi's work for the last years, and seeing him building in the garden, you know, they were all like small trees because it was beyond his time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something we should learn from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a good place to end. Thank you, Julie. I think that's really beautiful and profound. Please join me in thanking the four panelists.